So the way you test a theory is you compare it against another theory. So in all along so far in this class, I put a lot of emphasis on the, on the median voter theorem, but I've never been really clear about what alternative theory we should compare it against. So today, let me be clear about it. This is a theory that shows up a lot in poli-sci. The real alternative to the uh, median voter theorem as a way to explain how the place behind me is set up is cartel theory. It's a form of monopoly theory. You know what a cartel is. Uh, OPEC is the most famous one in the world right now. It's a cartel of oil producers, and their job is to try to keep the price of oil above the competitive market price. It's hard to do because people always want to cheat on the cartel's demand to produce less oil. Similarly, um, cartel theory in politics um, is the alternative to the median voter theorem. So here the cartel is the majority party. So right now the Democrats are the majority in the House of Representatives, and uh, according to cartel theory, the Democratic Party is trying to act like a cartel that pulls policies to the left of what the median voter theorem would predict. Um, if the betting markets are right and next year the Republicans are in charge, we'll have a, a cartel led by the Republicans trying to pull politics to the right of what the median voter theorem, of what the median voter in the House of Representatives would want. So in each case, you've got a cartel that's trying to keep something away from some very clear, simple equilibrium. OPEC's trying to keep the price above the competitive market price. Um, these folks here are trying to keep uh, political outcomes um, to the left or to the right of the median legislator's preference. So now with that as a way of um, in, in mind as an alternative, you, know, you can see that when it comes to committee setups for the setup of the key committees, House Ways and Means, the Appropriations Committees, uh, key legislative committees, the median voter theorem just totally wins hands down, right? And this, again, this, I've said it before, it's not caused by the Constitution. It's caused by, it seems to be caused by the invisible hand, by the self-interest of legislators themselves saying, what's the point in writing legislation in a committee that won't easily pass on the floor? Um, once you buy that reasoning, you realize that there's a sort of backward induction going on. Almost everything that's going on in the House has to be set up in a way so that at the end of the day, uh, legislation that people work on can get to 218, 219, 220 votes in the House of Representatives here. And if it can't do that, it doesn't happen. Part of what this means is that legislators really do have freedom to choose how to vote. Um, Nancy Pelosi is the Speaker of the House right now. Um, she doesn't, you know, you might say, well, she's the most, she's super powerful. She can just tell members of the House how to vote. She'll just threaten to hurt them in some way, if politically, if, uh, if they don't do what she wants. And of course, politicians have some kind of carrots and sticks around that they can use. John Boehner talks about this in his pretty candid book about serving as Speaker of the House. I recommend that book. It's called On the House. Um, but there just isn't that much they can do. So Nancy Pelosi cannot go up to a legislator um, on a regular basis and say, like, I know you're a really moderate Democrat from a seat that uh, voted for Trump by 5%. But I just, you just need to vote yes on all these very progressive bills over the next year. She just can't do that. Um, that she can try saying it, but they'll just laugh at her and tell her, you know, they'll, if they're smart, they'll be polite about how they say it. But they'll, um, they'll say something like, I'll think about it. And then when they go into the floor to vote with their little key card, um, they'll vote the way that their voters back home want. Anyway, um, so we've seen some implications of cartel theory a couple of ways here. Right here, we've seen it. Uh, and the, the way the houses are set up in the legislature, excuse me, we've seen how median voter theorem tests against the uh, cartel theory. And with committee set up, it just wins hands down. Uh, a lot of people are sure that in other parts of politics, the cartel theory is true. There's a lot of empirical research and more advanced American politics courses and studies of legislatures um, that look at this. You know, it's always kind of hard to tell. Um, uh, partly because most political outcomes are quite hard to measure um, on, a, on a strict left to right basis. So the last time I talked to an academic who was an expert on this area, he said, yeah, it's just, you know, we've done a lot of research on this. It's just really hard to tell um, whether political outcomes are close to what the median legislator wants or whether they're close to what the median member of the majority party wants. Um, a lot of things are sort of in that blurry area in between 
which is just what you'd expect if there's a little bit of both to reality. But again, on the one thing we can measure, committee makeup, very objective, very high stakes. Median voter theorem um, wins on every important committee except for the rules committee. And I've already explained why that's important in the slides, why that's a reasonable exception. Which brings us to um, this week's readings. So um, we've seen multiple reasons why there should be committees. Uh, one reason is the, uh, the division of labor gives legislators, um, gives certain legislators a strong incentive to help create a better bill for the whole house, right? Writing good legislation is hard. Nobody wants to do the homework. Everybody's hoping somebody else will do it. That's the free rider problem, which exists everywhere around here and especially over there. Those are the house office buildings over there. Um, that's where most of the real work gets done. And um, so you saw that uh, Kreeble's uh, information-centric story said that, well, the median member of the house wants people to do hard work on the bills, so division of labor is natural in a way Adam Smith would totally understand. This week, we see another reason, McKelvey's chaos theorem. Um, if politicians have multi-dimensional preferences, which obviously they do, um, and if those preferences don't exactly match up with the median voter theorem, um, on one, if they don't all map onto one dimension um, easily, then we can totally have chaos um, in, when Congress is considering bills that have five, 10, 20 different topics. So what does Congress do? Well, um, the way Shepsley puts it is that he says that Congress divides up the job so that each issue has its own committee and perhaps on that own committee, on the, on the Ways and Means Committee, which is the tax and, uh, most importantly, the tax committee, um, they can line people up left to right in a very simple way, politically. And when bills pass, they will always, almost always pass on a simple left to right political axis. Then on another committee, uh, a health care committee, where maybe the left to right politics don't work exactly the same as on taxes, they can have their own left to right vote. So it's another case where the division of labor can help create peace and stability, where McKelvey's chaos theorem made us think that, well, maybe just things could go crazy if people are allowed to vote on any particular alternative at any time. Real legislatures know this. It's not like they've studied McKelvey's chaos theorem or they phrase it the same way, but I've read past stories about speakers of the House of Representatives where they said that, you know, We've tried letting our bills get written on the floor where people can bring in amendments on new issues that aren't, you know, so a tax bill can turn into a health care bill, can turn into a judiciary bill. And he says, the problem is you just wind up with a lot of chaos. So every time people try to weaken the power of committees, um, there ends up being something that pulls them back to the power of committees. There are exceptions to this, a topic for a more advanced course, but... Um, Division of labor has certainly two key benefits. Uh, the Kreeble benefit of giving people an incentive to work hard on particular bills, and the McKelvey's chaos theorem benefit, where by dividing issues into one, taking up, biting off one piece at a time, you can help um, reduce the problem of legislative cycles and legislative chaos. So, um, one thing you should ask yourself, um, to, as a way of tying this to next week's readings, is to what extent are these members of Congress actually constrained by their voters back home? You know, we have clearly members, some members are to the left and some members to the right, um, and some members in the middle. But to what extent are they that way because the voters back home insist on it? Or is it more or less like a matter of taste? Or are they that way because of donations or... Um, political uh, contributions. What is it? Why do politicians hold the views they do? Um, the median voter theorem makes us should make you think that, well, a lot of it is going to be responsiveness to voters back home. If politicians start doing things that aren't popular back home, they start, um, they really risk the chance of losing their jobs. And politicians do like having their jobs here. And those of you who are huge fans of representative democracy, should think that that's a great thing when politicians sell out to their voters. Selling out to your voters, giving them what they want, doing what some would call pandering, that's exactly the promise and the hope of democracy. So next week, uh, you'll get to read some empirical research that tests to what extent voters 
uh, are able to control the views of their politicians? And or to what extent is it instead the case that political donors can shape the views of politicians? That's uh, just another way of testing the median voter theorem at the local level, just like our last two weeks have been testing the median voter theorem at, uh, in, in this place right here. So uh, keep up with the readings. Feel free to talk with me, especially about your committee assignments. Glad to talk about that with you and keep in touch.